Welcome to tonight's program. You can begin. Join the movement, the Coffin State Nonprofit Leadership Movement. Good evening. On behalf of Coppin State University's nonprofit leadership program, the Department of Applied Social and Political Sciences, and the College of Behavioral and Social Sciences, I would like to thank you this evening, welcome you to this evening's programming in recognition of National Black HIV AIDS Awareness Day. I am Dr. Tenyo Pearl, the campus director for Coppin State University's Nonprofit Leadership Alliance. Coppin State University offers undergraduate scholars interested in pursuing a future career in the nonprofit sector an opportunity to earn a BS degree in nonprofit leadership. Scholars may also declare a minor in nonprofit leadership, and also they have an opportunity to earn the CNP credential, the certified nonprofit, the certified nonprofit professional credential via the Nonprofit Leadership Alliance. According to the Maryland Association of Nonprofit Organizations, the independent sector is the fastest growing employment sector. Throughout the United States, there are approximately 1.5 million nonprofits in the United States, and also approximately 32,000 nonprofits in Maryland. This evening, I invite you to join the movement, the nonprofit leadership movement. The CSU Nonprofit Leadership Program excited to have this opportunity to collaborate with the Total Health Care. Total Health Care is a nonprofit and its mission is to improve health and quality of life in the community the organization serve. Total Health Care's vision is by 2024, every person in the communities the organization serve will have access to a patient-centered medical home that advances health equity across Maryland. Without further ado, it is an honor for me to introduce Mr. Darian Nolan, Total Health Care's Vice President of Philanthropy and Social Responsibility. Mr. Nolan will provide an overview of tonight's panel discussion. Let's talk about it, breaking the silence to end the HIV epidemic. Mr. Nolan. Thank you, Dr. Pro. I appreciate that warm introduction. I also want to say thank you to Coppin State University and the Nonprofit Leadership Program um, for partnering with us to have this much needed conversation um, amongst our community around how we can end the epidemic and end HIV. Um, I would also like to thank our other partners who have worked together not only for this event, um, but we also have another event tomorrow in HIV testing drive um, that would take place at Mondamin Mall here in Baltimore. Um, and those partners are Gilead Sciences, the Pride Center of Maryland, United Healthcare Community Plan, as well as um, Common State University. Uh, so thank you all. Um, and to give us more information as to why this event and why this day of awareness is important, I'm um, a Common State student um, who is a social work major as well as a nonprofit leadership major, Mr. Tyler Fullwood. Hello, today, February 7th is National Black HIV AIDS Awareness Day. Since 1999, National Black HIV AIDS Awareness Day, the days have been observed to increase HIV education, testing, community involvement, and treatment among black communities. While there has been great progress in reducing the number of new infections of HIV, the black community is still impacted at greater percentages than our peers. While approximate 12.4% of the US population 42% of all new HIV diagnoses are among African-American persons and among women. 57% of new diagnoses are AA women while they only represent 13% of all women. As future policymakers, scientists, educators, public health advocates, 
and global citizens, our college community is critical to reducing the impact of HIV and ending the epidemic for future generations. It's important that we have these conversations as a community, so we welcome you to be engaged, ask questions, and break the silence to end the epidemic. Thank you, Tyler. I appreciate you giving us the purpose of National Black HIV and AIDS Awareness Day. Um, again, we at Total Healthcare will have a HIV testing drive at our Mondawmin location tomorrow, February 8th, from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. We welcome any and everyone to join us in this awareness and in observation of National HIV Awareness Day. Um, whether HIV positive or not, we all have a role to play in ending the epidemic. I'm very excited to welcome Mr. Mouse Jones, uh, who will be our moderator for this evening. Um, Mouse Jones is a multifaceted, nationally recognized artist in both the Black media and pop, pop culture industry. He is a podcast host, uh, personality, and he is known for just real, being real honest with his tongue. Um, he is sharing both his world um, as a digital influencer and as a native New Yorker and a unique talent um, who has a captivating presence. We're very honored to have him with us today. So I'll turn it over to Mouse Jones. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, it's, a, it's an absolute pleasure to, to be on this panel. Um, you, you know, when, when the opportunity arose, you know, it, it means something, this means something to me. Uh, so I was more than uh, honored and happy to be a, to be a part of this. Um, so I'm ready to jump into it. If everyone else is, um, we're gonna kick this off uh, by getting into the uh, intro to stigma video by Miss Nikki J. So what happened was, um, I thought I had the flu. My roommate was taking care of me. I had a friend taking care of me, but they weren't getting sick. We went to the health department. I got tested for everything. And he got to the words, um, your HIV results. He said, they're positive. I had no community. I didn't know any other woman living with HIV. I knew about men who were living with HIV and I know about older women, but nobody my age being diagnosed with HIV, you start telling yourself that you're nasty or you're tainted. I felt like it took my voice. I felt like I didn't have one anymore. That's just not true. It's not true. Sometimes I forget about how hard it was to even say stuff out loud and how like people you still have a voice, you just gotta use it. My husband would tell me, I'm gonna support you in whatever you do. I promise I'm gonna support you. He made me say, Oh, it's time. There's so many ways that we can cope with our diagnosis, but writing has been the most therapeutic because I can get it out on the paper. I'm not my status. Um, not my status. I had a feeling in me like, it has to be more of us. More women that are not talking. It has to be another woman that I can lean on that can lean on me. I have to share this story because I don't see what I need, so I gotta create it. All right, thank you, thank you. So now I want to introduce the panel that, that we have the pleasure of speaking with. So just real quick, I'm gonna ask you guys to uh, starting with uh, Miss Nikki J, um, you know, let the people know who you are and uh, what it is that you do regarding, you know, research. My name is Nikki Jackson and I am an author, a speaker, 
and an HIV advocate in my community in my community in the great city of Atlanta, Georgia. So that's a little bit about me. All right. All right. And then we have, I'm I'm praying I say this right. We have, oh, well, there's a quote here. We have Mr. Trey Wills, uh, Trey Wilson. <laughs> Thank you, Miles. I appreciate that. Um, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Trey Wilson, Trey Moore. But for short, you can just call me Trey Wilson. I am um, the Senior Director of Programming and Planning for the Pratt Center of Maryland. But more importantly, I am a uh, speaker. I'm an advocate. I do um, poetry. And I do a lot of writing and research around destigmatizing HIV and public health initiatives of how to, you know, move the Black community in the right direction around such things like that. Thank you. Thank you. It is Trey. I'm over here saying try. Yeah, and Trey. <laughs> I'm, I'm supposed to be the moderator. I can't read. My apologies. <laughs> I'm not going to mess this name up. And last but certainly not least, uh, we have Malcolm Dewery, uh, Dr. Malcolm du uh, Drury. I'm see. Okay. I'll be, I'll be jinxing myself. I said I wasn't going to mess this up, mess up, then I messed up. But yes, Dr. Drury, please introduce yourself to the, uh, the people in the panel. Um, good evening, everybody. That was a good try. Um, I was, you actually got it the second time around, so I appreciate uh, you, you sticking with it. Um, good evening, everybody. Um, as Mouse indicated, my name is uh, Malcolm Drury, and I am an assistant professor of sociology um, at Coppin State University. Um, and one of the things that I do also, like in the community, I have a nonprofit organization in Forestville, Maryland. And through engagements of, you know, the programs that we hold in, uh, in Forestville, we provide information on HIV awareness um, and information about clinics and um, where people can receive medication. And we try to encourage, you know, our participants to get, you know, tested um, maybe twice a year. Um, and we you know, encourage our participants to, um, you know, try to destigmatize HIV in the community. And we are very lucky to have you as we are to have all three of you guys on this panel today. Um, so I kind of want to jump in. Okay. All right. Um, no, what's happening here? Oh, my, all right. Technology is kicking my behind today. Can y'all hear me? Everybody can hear me? Yes. Okay. Okay, I got it now. All right. Um, so yes, um, so right off the bat, all three of you guys immediately said, you know, the same at the same term when we said, you know, destigmatizing uh our community's view and the world's view, you know, on HIV AIDS. Um, so I do I wanna ask um Miss Nikki and uh and Trey, I wanna ask like what specific well, Miss Nikki, we seen your video, but you know. What inspired you guys and, and uh, drew you guys to the work you're doing um, in HIV AIDS prevention and advocacy? Um, well, I can start. So for me, I was diagnosed as a teenager. I was a first year college student when I received my diagnosis. But prior to, I already had been doing youth advocacy work in my community. So I had been traveling around the country teaching youth about different topics. So after a few years of fighting my own battles alone and having to do so much research, I just did not find what I was looking for. I could not find a community of other young women that were Black, African-American women that were living with HIV. Um, only support I had was my doctor's office, really. And because I didn't go through the community for work, for uh, care, it became even more difficult to see people that looked like me. So it was honestly a calling by God. He was like, I need you to write the book. And I did not want to, if I could be honest, I was like, I don't want to tell my story. I don't want to do that. And after I wrote the book, so many things just began to open up and I started a support group and I started to realize that there was still a need even after so many years of my diagnosis. And so it just inspired me to keep going, um, keep providing more services to women living with HIV and also working on the prevention side because there's a need and it still needs to be more awareness even after 40 years of this epidemic going on. So I just felt like I needed to be a part of the change that I wanted to see, I could no longer sit around and just watch things happen and not do anything about it. What, what, 
I want to ask you, because you said you received the diagnosis um, when you were a teenager. So like, just real quick, if you could, like, what were some of the things you, you know, encountered in, in getting to this point of advocacy, right? Because, you know, no matter what the thing is, right, no matter what the thing is that we're afflicted with, tip, you know, it takes a certain level of overcoming to actually begin, begin the, the, the process of advocating and advocacy for others. So how did you, you know, kind of um, remove yourself um, from that to be able to speak and help others? So how I was able to remove myself from that is I fought my battles first. So I went through a lot of dealing with depression and anxiety. And also I always say this saying like HIV speaks. So HIV was telling me that I wasn't going to live long. It was telling me that you can't do anything that you want it, that you want to do. And I'm very ambitious actually. So I was on a mission to say, you can't tell me what to do. God has told me that I have a calling on my life and that I will help other people. And now I'm on assignment to get to that place. So what happened was I began to really take care of myself and really seek out services that I need, whether it's like I need to go talk to a therapist. Um, I started to look for different ways to cope. I stayed on the internet streets all the time. I stayed researching. I also had a church that I went to that actually had a ministry around HIV and AIDS. And that was my first time helping without ever sharing my status. And that really helped me so much. And I was like, imagine if I was bold enough to share my status and also provide something um, like this. And so as I overcame, I realized that my life had gotten better. I was thriving. I had a very good career. I was married. I'm married. I'm like, I'm good. And then God was like, but we're not good. There are some other people for you to go help. Now you need to show them what you did. And those were some of the obstacles that I had to overcome, especially, and I want to say stigma was a big one. Stigma kept me bound for a long time. I would have started sooner if it wasn't for the battle of me fighting the stigma that's still associated with HIV. Well, I'm, I'm glad you fought in here looking fine and in front of this camera. Thank you. I'm so, Trey, the same question to you. What um, inspired and, and drew you to the HIV AIDS prevention advocacy work that you do today? Thank you, Mouth. Thank you. <clears throat> um, yeah, this, this question for me here is uh, a little emotional, you all, so just bear with me a little bit. Um, so what originally drew me to do this work was I had three um, of the most important people in my life, the most influential people in my life. Um, my interaction and my gathering with them was so unique and diverse, right? So um, I lost my best friend. Um, you know, the only person I felt that ever knew me or understood who I was, you know, from AIDS. And it was hard. It was really hard because uh, for so many years and times, I just like, you know, can we can we swap spots, you know, can, can I be gone and you be here and, and, and live your life? And I watched the, the strength that they had. I watched the energy that came from it. I watched how, um, how every day they did not, even though they knew that, you know, that at this point it was, um, it was coming, you know, as the doctor's home, like, Hey, you only got a few months left. I watched how every day they just made the best of it. And that was, um, you know, one of my first interactions with, um, you know, with the person that's really special to me. So, um, and then what happened was I met an individual and I was really close to an individual who, you know, ended up uh, developing AIDS um, by having HIV at birth, right? Uh, so, you know, the medication and things like that, it's a lot different, the treatment is different. So I met someone who, uh, who received HIV through birth. And then I met someone else who um, was a part of the LGBTQ community and received it that way. And then um, I met someone, who, um, someone else who also later ended up passing away from the development of AIDS, but it came from drug use, right? So for me, it came out of pure ignorance, right? Um, I never really knew, right? For years, HIV uh, was looked at, AIDS was looked at as a, a, as a gay disease, right? Or more targeted to the LGBT community. And I thought that, you know, even in my mindset um, for so long, but then I've seen these, these great different amount of individuals who, you know, who've been diagnosed with it, who's living with it, and some who, did, who was not able to be here today. And I think so more importantly, when I saw that and I knew the stigma that I had, I knew, um, 
I knew kind of my ignorance. I knew that it had to be my mission to educate other people. Like, you know, so it was never really a job. It became my mission. It became my charge to, uh, you know, to educate other individuals because, you know, I, I seen these people be teared down. I seen these people be misunderstood. I seen these people be destroyed, you know, publicly, privately, you know, and, and that for me, it just was so deep for me because, you know, to this day now, I lost all three of those people. Um, and it just was like, you know, similar to Anika, like sometimes it just become, it, it, it becomes your path. You have to, right? And I think that's something that God said, yeah, you're not, you know, this is this is what I have for you. And I think um, that's what drew me to doing the work. So the, what I love about hearing um, and obviously, you know, it's not, it's not up to me, like, you know, it's, I'm, I'm, I'm no one, um, just someone inspired, but, you know, I loved hearing that, you know, through, through both you, uh, Trey and Nikki's journeys, whatever they were, uh, the thing they were afflicted with or dealt with, they used to help inspire and save others. I, I really love that. And, um, I'm, I'm really, I, I, like, that's what I'm passionate about, right? Like, us turning inwards, right? Like being able to turn inwards and help our own, no matter what's, uh, you know, trying to tear us down. So, you know, I am very thankful and inspired to uh, to be on this panel once again with, with Nikki and Trey. Um, so moving over to Dr. Drury, um, I want to ask you a, a bit different question. Uh, I want to ask you, what do you think, at, uh, or why should I say, do you think as a community specifically black and brown people continue to be disproportionately impacted by by HIV AIDS and uh do you see this as the impact of the stigma um that is a great question mouse um one of the things that I, I remember back in July 2010 um President Barack Obama stated that the United States will become a place where new HIV infections are rare. Um, and when they do occur, every person, regardless of age, gender, race, ethnicity, sexual orientation, gender identity, or social economic circumstances, will have unfettered access to high quality life, extended care, free from stigma and discrimination. And as we look at the you know, or, you know, we, we heard some of the data about, you know, HIV AIDS and, and in, in many states, while black and brown people, you know, may only make up a small proportion of the population, they often make up the most of the new HIV cases in the state. And so why is that? Um, black men know um, what HIV is. Um, we all know, you know, how to wear condoms, um, you know, but despite the, the high percentages, you know, we look at these numbers and tell ourselves that, you know, everything will be all right. And so, like, there are many myths that float around, you know, concerning the transmission of HIV um, with finger pointing at, you know, such individuals as gay men or drug injectors or, you know, Africans, um, you know, and other people. Um, and the media feeds on these myths. And as a result, you know, education to all individuals about HIV AIDS become difficult. Um, and we've all heard that, you know, HIV AIDS is the, you know, a gay disease, um, you know, as Trace uh, mentioned. Um, and also, despite the high rate of HIV infection in white men in, in the early years, HIV has also been said to be a Black disease. So the first two myths involve homophobia and racism. But what research has shown us is that the stigma of the myths surrounding HIV and AIDS is the most dangerous because many health conditions are associated with stigma, including HIV. Stigma creates pathways to unfavorable social conditions. Um, as stigmas fuel prejudice, it fuels discrimination. Um, and that creates unfavorable social conditions. 
So, and, and when that individual is faced with these unfavorable social conditions, it creates risks of risky behavior, which in turn creates risks of HIV transmission. So, I mean, it's a lot to unpack. It's a lot to think about, but, um, you know, that's how stigma does play a part in, you know, in what we're seeing. Thank you for that. I mean, you can't even ask for a better answer to, you know, such a, a such a, a large question like that. You can't even ask for a better answer. Um, so I, I want to pose this question to all three of you. Um, what are the conversations that are like super, super pertinent, necessary uh, to, to, to have uh, in order to end the epidemic, the HIV epidemic? And uh, how has that changed with the global pandemic, uh, global pandemic? Uh, I guess, Trey, you could kick that one off. Of course you would go with me first. Gotcha. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. I'm going to need you to do a favor. Read that question to me again, because that's a lot there to unpack. Absolutely. Uh, so let's break I'll, I'll break it up in two parts, right? So um, what are the conversations needed to end the HIV epidemic? Okay. Uh, first, you know, before I start, I definitely want to say that um, this is... Uh, morally partial of it. It's going to be part of my, um, it's going to be part of research I have done and other parts will be a part of my opinion, right? Um, so with stating that, um, I think the conversations that need to be had is that um, the same conversation that's had with COVID, right? Um, I attacked, um, you know, when looking at um, HIV and teaching and educating about HIV, I attack it now the same exact way I attack COVID. That COVID Anybody can catch COVID, right? It's not a, it's not restricted to a, a certain type of person or a certain body type or a certain way a person look, right? Anyone can. So when you know that conversation of saying that, you know, no one is out of the bracket of being potentially able to, you know, you know, attract HIV, and more importantly, those that do. It does not mean that they made a bad life decision, right? It does not mean that they're interacting with risky behavior. So I think the conversation that I do when I do um, my research or when I do my teaching, I, I attack it for more of the um, more of the uh, the front of you know what is HIV, right? How do it affect individuals, right? And how you know can it be attracted? Like what is all the possibilities that it could come from? But to be uh, to dive a little bit more deeply into that, one of the research I'm doing right now and doing some educational things around is the attraction of HIV um, through um, oral sex, right? And I have been doing that more importantly because a survey that was comp uh, that was done about uh, about seven months ago now, I asked people, you know, just want to know from their opinion, can you get HIV through oral sex or not, right? And when receiving these results back, although it was only done about 4,000 individuals, receiving these thoughts, um, these results back, 96% um, or 90, 95% of the individuals believed that like there was no possible way that you could get it through do oral sex, right? So I think that just, you know, a true understanding of all the possible possible ways that it can be contracted and then a complete understanding of no one is immune from it, right? Like, you know, you know, this is something we deal with together and it takes everyone, you know, combining together to actually end this epidemic. And it's not that, you know, you know, uh, just that those who are black have to, or those who are gay or those who use substances. No, it's about all of us coming together and really talking about the face front of this, um, you know, of HIV and AIDS and things like that. And I think that from my pain and through my research should be a conversation that need to be had a little bit more. Mm. Uh, I'm, I'm gonna throw it to you, uh, Dr. Drury. Um, same, same question, what, what, are the, uh, what are the conversation needed to kind of end the HIV epidemic? Um, that is, uh, Trey did a great job in answering that question. That's, that's, a, that's a difficult question. And I think it can be approached from like many different angles. And sometimes I feel like a, a, in, in talking about health, um, and it's, it's an area that we talk about within sociology, uh, medical sociology, but sometimes I feel like a broken record by saying this, but to achieve health equality and to end an HIV epidemic, 
um, the nation must overcome systematic racism, homophobia, transphobia, um, HIV related stigma, you know, and, and all type of other ingrained barriers that have contributed to the, you know, disparities for so long. Um, one of the keys to, you know, resolving this issue is, is innovation. Um, you know, a, a total person health approach, you know, uh, to care that integrates HIV prevention and, and treatment into health services that people are already seeking. Um, like this type of approach also answers questions about interconnected epidemics, such as, you know, sexually transmitted infections, um, hepatitis, um, mm. HIV self-testing and mobile services um, should be ma maximized to reach people like where they are, um, you know, which for many is, is outside the traditional healthcare settings. People are not able to get to the places, so they have to come where they are and provide um, testing. Um, and, and just like Trey said, you have to approach it almost like we're doing with um, the current pandemic that we're going through now. Um, you know, a lot of these health systems don't have the capacity to implement the most recent advances in HIV prevention and care to all the communities. And so it's going to take that innovation. It's going to take that forward thinking in order to help resolve this issue. Thank you. And uh, uh, Nikki, um, kind of the same question, but a little with a little, a little different tweak to it. Um, and, and because you're living this thing firsthand, right? Have, have you seen, you know, have you seen these conversations begin to change during about the epidemic and the way it needs to be, uh, you know, kind of attacked? Um, have you seen it change during this actual global pandemic or the current global pandemic? If I could be honest, I think they decreased because everybody's attention went to COVID. Mm. Everybody's, but what for me as a person living with HIV since you brought it up, uh, it was almost like a little bit of a shock for me because the same stigma they had against people with COVID was the same thing happening with HIV. Like people would be afraid to say, I have a COVID diagnosis because you start treating them differently. Uh, don't come over my house. It kept mm -hmm. people isolated. Nobody mm -hmm. didn't want to be around their own family. It was so, and it was hard. And then also uh, people living with HIV had to stay home longer. And I don't think a lot of people realized that. So when people were allowed to go outside, we were a part of the people with the weakened immune system, 65 and older. So many people were in their homes, eight, nine, 10 months. Mm. barely leaving and that did not play well on mental health so then we have another myriad of things that were interconnected so that was the effect for as a woman living with HIV and even those that I serve I started to see that and I start to speak up about it um, of course there's always more conversations that needs to be had like what you said Dr. Jury and you Trey it was amazing I was like this is really really good there needs to be more conversations um from all people from all walks of life because I can say it and as a woman with HIV and sometimes you could be kind of removed from it because it's like oh that's her story that's her life but then when you have other people coming in as a community because the COVID people who didn't have COVID you had COVID everybody talked about it and I think that we have to do something about the healthcare system. As somebody who worked in healthcare, it really helped me to say, I gotta do something because I remember getting an HIV test done and not knowing what to do next. Hmm. We gotta make sure that there is a connection and that we're connecting with the organizations. There are organizations that are doing the work. Um, people are getting diagnosed in hospitals and they're sending them home. Some people don't follow up after they go to the hospital. They don't know what to do. And I remember being someone in the healthcare system that would know what to do. And I would have to say, here, you need to go to this place, this place, and that place. But it was because of my lived experience, not because I was trained that way. Mm. So I think there are so many conversations that still need to be had. And I feel like doing things like this work. So if you're like watching, showing up to these things, inviting your friends to come and participating, it means a lot because you take information and then you can go have a conversation with those around you. And then it gets out further and further. But we all have to play a role, just like we did with COVID. We all have to play a role with this HIV epidemic. 
Thank you. Um, the next question I have uh, is, is a rather interesting one. It, it, you know, it kind of merges the line of, you know, science, but also like social experiments or social, you know, engagement. Um, we live, we're living in an age where everything is about virility, right? Like everything is about social media virility. How, what can go viral? How do we get a viral, you know? Um, we, we seen a few years back the ALS ice challenge ice bucket challenge i'm not I, i'm still confused today uh as to what that was supposed to do or what the the point of it was um so i, I want to ask you right i, I don't want to ask you guys like oh is there something that could go viral about hiv aids no um but i, I do want to ask is there a way to spread the word or, or spread awareness via social media in an effective way that isn't uh um you know a, a sad montage or like a uh, is there a way to use social media to, to further the, uh, the spread of awareness? Um, and I'm going to, I'm going to start right back with you, Nikki. Uh, well, I love this question. So I'm actually excited to answer because mm -hmm. I use social media as a way to educate people around this topic. So I think there are several ways. So we're, a lot of people are into short, short form content right now. So TikToks, Reels, Shorts on YouTube, like you can take the, I think it's, 10, 30, I don't know how long, that short time to educate people and keep their attention um, and it sparks them to have a conversation. And the more they see, because you know, you have to see things a few times, the more people they see participating, the more people they see talking about it, and the more people speaking up will uh, encourage people to do something about it. So I think, especially like with uh, people living with HIV or if you're just an HIV advocate, if you're talking about influence matters. So many people have influence, right? And you are influenced and you have all these followers. If you bring up the topic of HIV, while it may not be something popular or normal that you talk about, it will cause people listen to you because you have influence. Mm. So I feel like we are all influenced by somebody on social media. And when they talk, we listen. So I feel like there's a way to incorporate influencers with this epidemic to talk about it on social media. It is an amazing tool. And it also makes things easier for people. Like I think about, I do a lot of my work on social media. So when I'm trying to get out to people who are living with HIV who need the support group, I've used the systems of social media to allow them to get that confidential and to still be able to get what they need in a way that's safe for them to encourage them to seek out what they need. So I think that's all I want to say about it, but I love the tool of social media to get the word out because that's how I got my start and that's how people hear most of my story and that's how I that kind of helped me get my message out and my story out. And it has just blessed so many people thus far. So I know that it could help if other people also do that. Uh, also saying, if you guys, um, oh, well, before I actually, you know, pass it to the fellas, um, I do want to ask um, just for the people watching, are there any, uh, are there any specific uh, influencers or specific content creators around uh, HIV awareness that you would want to like shout out as using the platforms properly that that's spreading, you know, awareness? Nikki? Well, I know a whole bunch of uh, African American women, HIV and AIDS advocates. So you got like Hadia Broaden, you got Masonia Trailer, uh, you have Cece Coleman. I, I know so many of them and I could go on and on. And it was, and they're always finding unique ways to share um, their story. And then also there's an organization I want to say called The Well Project. And they do blogs that are written by and for women living with HIV and they share all their stuff on social media and so many women are just touched by the stories via blogging and that's one way and they do it very well. Thank you. Um, same same question if you know if, if, you, if you Trey or you Dr. Drury, um, if you guys have any uh, thoughts on how to use social media or or the internet in its all in all its capacity that uh that could help spread awareness in an effective way in today's society um either one of you guys could pick that up um i'll i'll jump in on that one um actually i'm and i'm the opposite of nikki like i'm no social media uh, <laughs> but 
I know I know one of the things, and this is something that I, I've I've seen, um, you know, as as far as HIV AIDS awareness, and it, it's it's a, a plan for America initiative, um, and this initiative is aimed at reducing HIV infection by, you know, ninety percent or new and new HIV infections by ninety percent um, by twenty thirty. Um, as I said, like I don't do much of social media, but I know one of the things that like when I go to the gym, for some reason, like every in the in the morning, I hear this commercial by Chuck D. I might be aging myself, but he's always <laughs> in this commercial. Chuck D is always talking about get your colon check. If you're over the age of 45, get your colon check. It seems like every 10 minutes that commercial keeps coming on. Like if something like that, and, and, and like you mentioned influencers or, or people who are, are prominent or somebody that can grab somebody's attention and repeatedly come up with this message, you know, get tested or, you know, seek help um, or something like that. Something like I'm constantly, so now I'm like in the gym, like, dang, I, know, I need to go get my colon check. <laughs> um, so I'm thinking about it a little bit more. Um, it's, it's in my mind um, and, you know, it's something that I feel that, you know, I need to do. And I feel that this can be like the same thing. Thank you. Trey, you got anything on that one? Yes. First, I would like to say, uh, Dr. Drury, you definitely did tell us your age a little bit, but it's cool. Um, and then I would definitely like to um, put a, a little, I guess, insight um, on to it. So I've been thinking about this question pretty hard, you all, like definitely really hard. And, um, and I've been actually trying to do a little bit of this work, um, taking advantage of like TikTok and Instagram, because, you know, how do we, you know, keep the attention of, you know, our, 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 our listeners, our watchers, right? And how do we increase reposts and all those good things? So I took it from a different approach. And I think this, this, this approach may be, um, you know, it could be controversial, but I think it could also be really, um, really great. So when we think about HIV and when we think about AIDS, um, it, it, it can depend on what community, right? We talk about it, but um, I have seen in the community work I do, some people are, um, what I do, air quotes, tired of talking about HIV, right? there, you know, it, it be drained in their head and, it, and, and they're tired. And some won't click on something, you know, based on what the title of it is, it's some will, right? So what I'm thinking of is like, how do we make talking about it a little bit, sorry for my lack of better words, sexy, right? How do we make talking about it, you know, attractive? Like what's good, how, how do we do that? And so one of the campaigns I have really been looking at is, um, okay? One of the campaigns I have been looking at is like, one, how do you make it sexy to talk about? How do you make it attractive to talk about? So I've been looking at, you know, uh, uh, finding individuals who may be positive, but have partners who are negative and kind of like, you know, doing videos or making things go viral that like one, like, hey, you know, I'm, I'm married to someone, I'm with someone who is HIV positive and, and I am negative and I'm happy, like I'm in love, I have my life. And the reason why I say that more importantly, because when I think about, you know, spreading awareness of HIV, I think about it on multi levels. And one of the most important levels to me is when I think about uh, the stigma of it, when um, a lot of times when I, ha I have new individuals who are diagnosed positive with HIV, they think about, um, sometimes you hear them say, oh, I don't feel, um, I don't, am I ever going to find someone I want to be, be with? Is anyone going to want me anymore, right? And that's, uh, that's a, a known stigma that comes up even in those who recently attract HIV, feeling like they don't know if they're going to be wanted, if someone's going to want them, if someone's going to want to be with them, right? So then I'm like, okay, how do we show those individuals um, who maybe just got a diagnosis and maybe who, who's very nervous that there's people out here who, you know, who are with people who are negative and living a perfectly fine and happy life, right? Who's, you know, still vacation and still living that dream, uh, American dream or whatever kind of lifestyle they want to live. And then also that, you know, that helps those individuals, but then it also helps individuals who are negative that be like, um, you know, who are negative that breaks the stigmas of, of being open to being with someone or being open to understand that individual a little bit, uh, a little bit better. So I would like to go in the direction of that, right? So looking at, um, you know, looking at something, some type of campaign around there 
um, that I think it, it, it would, you know, it, it, it would kill two birds with one stone, pretty much. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, so I know we've been talking for a while and, you know, uh, we've been sounding real smart. And I know sometimes, at least for me, it sounds as smart as draining. So we going to just take a little break, a little intermission break. Um, and during that break, we're going to get into uh, this video from Dimitri um, about being a community in support. Having to tell my parents is one of the hardest things I've ever had to do. I felt like I wanted to But there was a revelation for to bring something Having to tell my parents was one of the hardest things I've ever had to do. I felt like I wanted to die. But there was a revelation. I think the first step to breaking stigma is to talk about it. Either you're recently diagnosed or you have a loved one in your life or you want to know more, um, that's where I come in to help start those discussions. We have to meet people where they are. And something that I talk about, particularly being a first generation born Haitian American, is that HIV and being gay and uh, LGBTQ issues are not things that you talk about. And how do we get people to start talking about it because the stigma is so real? We have to be willing to go into those uncomfortable places and understand that by speaking those words, by being able to say, I am HIV positive and say that openly, it's so freeing. <laughs> Just imagine what could happen if we started having these conversations and in open ways, in loving ways, and in, in understanding ways, and empathetic ways. I was able to put a face to it for my parents. It was very difficult, but once I was able to teach them to see that I can still do all of the things that I am doing in my life, now our relationship has like grown exponentially. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, welcome back, welcome back to my uh, esteemed panelists. Um, hope you guys, you know, enjoyed your break. Um, we're gonna jump right back into it. Um, I actually have a question I wanna ask. Uh, I'll ask this to everybody. Um, as, it, as, uh, as they continue to evolve, what is the actual role that the African, immunity, African American community pillars, uh, be it places of faith, beauty, barbershop, education institutions, uh, what role will, should they or will they have in addressing or breaking the stigma around HIV AIDS? Um, I guess I'll, I'll start with Dr. Drury. Um, thank you, Miles. Uh, another great question. Um, one of the things that, you know, this is still an 
epidemic in our community. You know, our numbers are are growing. Our numbers are are rising, and I feel that we, although there are many factors that contribute to the rise of HIV um, AIDS infection in our community, I feel that that we need to take responsibility you know, from the ground up. And that's how we resolve our issues. And we resolve our issues through ground, you know, grassroots efforts, um, through our businesses, through our organizations. Um, And if there are resources out there, you know, to help to reduce them, remember what I said that, you know, by 2030, you know, we're supposed to be able to reduce the number of new infections by 90%. If those resources are out there, if that information is out there, we need to go get it, bring it back to our community, bring it to the, the Black church is still, you know, you know the, the, we, we do see a change in people going to church, but it's still, you know, one of our most dynamic and most influential institutions out there. You know, that information needs to be in the black church and and put out to everybody and you know it, it needs to be in our barbershops my 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 barbershop my friends that own the barbershop has a podcast yeah you know where they talk about issues you know like I almost are sitting around everybody sitting around in a barber chair talking about issues going on in the community like they have a podcast so why can't this be a part of their podcast why can't this be a topic? Why can't they raise awareness with that podcast? You know, and so bringing about that information and sharing it as much as possible, because really, you know, despite what we're talking about today, I very rarely hear about, you know, HIV. Um, and as Nikki indicated, like she's living with it every day, so she has to think about it. But I don't think many of us are thinking about it too much because it's not in our face but we need to bring it back to our community and put it in our faces so we can help, you know, do something about this and, and uh, reduce, you know, the number of new cases. Mm. Uh, what's your take on that, Trey? Awesome. Thank you. Um, I think once again, it was definitely a little bit of a question. So, um, I think what we can do, um, I guess in these spaces, right, to break the stigmas around HIV and AIDS, I think uh, very similar to what Dr. Drury just said, right? I think um, we can be the influential drive of, you know, letting them know that this is a conversation that is needed to have. And, you know, for sake of sounding redundant, right? I think that um, a lot of individuals are not aware of, you know, what like well, what, well, what conversation? I think we're we're so big on well, what's going to grab people's attention? What's going to grab people's eye? What you know? What do people want to hear? And we're not in the sight of what do they need to hear or what do they need to talk about? Because we're so you know drowned into the ideas of what they want to talk about. So what I think, um, I guess, the role I think that we should uh, play is really bringing it to the table. But I guess to talk from my personal point of view, I know um, for my family and for my friends, more importantly, um, the biggest part is uh, really bringing them to the table to know, uh, you know, to help them break the stigmas, right? And to kind of force them or ask them or educate them to talk about it with their friends, right? So when I look at a group of individuals, it is uh, 42 individuals on this call, right? If all 42 of us go to our close friends, right? I know I have a close friend of about 10, right? And all 42 of us go to our close friends and we start that ripple effect, we'll see the widespread of our education, the widespread of our research start to to trickle out a lot more. So I think that, um, like I said, like Dr. Jury said, it's really, really, really important to, you know, sit at these tables, right? So anytime my community have any type of function, I'm, I come to sit at the table, right? So rather it's a town hall, 
that's about, you know, violence in the community. I come to sit at the table for a whole different perspective, right? Rather than the town hall that the mayor's office got, I come to sit at that table because I think that what we do is we we don't we don't sit at enough tables, right? So I guess what I would charge myself as well as the African American community more specifically to sit at more tables and to be the driving force to make sure that these things are talked about. Because if we're not, we see in the community and in the work we do that if the things don't get brought up by us, sometimes it won't get brought up at all, right? So I think just, you know, really taking a seat at those tables and kind of just like pushing out for us to actually bring these topics up. That is what I, what first thing come to my mind. And uh, Nikki, same question, except from like a, uh, a different POV, because I think we're, you know, uh, with, with Dr. Drury and, and Trey, we, it's easy to discuss what we should do, right? Um, and it's easy to, you know, for people to hear that, or these institutions, should I say, to hear that and say, oh, we do that, we do that, we do that. Um, but in, in, in my experience with advocacy, it always works better to put a mirror in front of someone, right? So um, in your in your experience is just, you know, as everyday person, can you speak about some of what these pillars are doing that strengthens that stigma that that, that we're trying to break? Um, yes. So I, I love this question. So thank you for what you said, Trey. I love the thing you said about having a seat at the table because I have a seat at a lot of different tables on purpose. Uh, to make sure that my voice is heard in different sectors, because I do a, I do a lot of things actually, but I will say that one thing I want to talk about in the faith community, uh, sometimes when I share my story as somebody who spoke up, I see the atmosphere change. But there have been so many times where I've been at church or people share their testimony or they say something like, "Thank God I didn't get AIDS." Number one, that's not the right wording. So they don't know the language. It's people first language, which, you know, you can look that up on cdc.gov. So, <laughs> you know, they don't know the language. Or sometimes I've heard pastors say things over the pulpit that are offensive, very offensive. And it's almost like we're not going to talk about that because we have to go back to the fact that we don't even want to talk about sex. So if we don't want to talk about sex. We definitely not going to talk about HIV. So those are some of the things, but most of it is the language and the miseducation. I've seen people of great influence say things that are just not correct, that has added more to stigma, and it almost blocks a person from being able to speak up about what's, what's going on with them. And then in our own community, as far as in like our families, our families are not talking about it. The first time my family talked about HIV was when I told them. And unfortunately, some of them found out when I put out a YouTube video because I didn't even have the capacity to continue to tell each one of my family members about my diagnosis because by that time it had been years and they didn't know. So some of us aren't even telling our families because of the stigma that comes out of their mouth, right? The things that they say, and they don't even know that they're being offensive. So we have to change how we talk about this and we have to create safe spaces because there's probably somebody close to you that's not telling you their diagnosis because of things that you have said or things that you have shown them. And faith, I, I gotta stay on this faith thing just a little bit because faith has a positive relationship on people living with HIV. And when you don't create the safe space inside of religious sectors, if you go to church or synagogue, however, whatever religion you follow, you block them out even, you block us out because I'm a part of that community. You block us out even more and make us become even more quieter and drawn back. And so then we don't say anything and isolation is not good for us because mental health is an issue too. There are so many multifaceted issues around living with HIV. And I feel that sometimes we, we think in our community, it's not happening to us and it's not happening to anyone around us when it's probably not true because I encountered a lot of people over all the years that I didn't was not sharing my status. And I'm not talking about relationship wise, I'm talking about like in general relationships, like friends, family, coworkers, and they, it was, they didn't need to know, right? And I didn't want to tell them because you, you test it out. As a woman with HIV, you say something about a movie they talked about it, a book, to see what they're going to say, and they fall for it. And mm -hmm. they say something wild, and then you say, I ain't telling you now. So I think we just have to create safe spaces 
We got to be honest. When you look at the numbers, it's disproportionately affecting Black people, right? And at the end of the day, if you're Black, you, you know Black people. We have a whole National Awareness Day about it. So we have to change our language because you never know who you're offending um, and you never know where you're cutting someone off from what they actually need from you. Mm, that's good. Um, real quick, Dr. Drury, I just want to make a connection. Um, when, when Nikki was speaking about, you know, the, 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 the positive side, when, when, you know, these institutions of faith are doing the right thing regarding this, can you speak a, a bit about that intersection between faith and science, like when there is a positive, um, when there's a positive support system? Um, that positive support system is, is, is very important. And in order to, you know, ratify these, these situations or, you know, to get rid of the stigma, um, if everybody is approaching things from a negative perspective, it's no way in the world that we're going to be able to resolve you know, what is going on in our community. If everybody's looking at it, you know, from unsympathetic eyes to, you know, what other people are going through, um, we're never going to get past that. And that's not, that's not how we are, you know, traditionally as a people. We are very sympathetic to others. Um, we, we are not like, you know, the, the dominant culture. Um, and like, it's just the, you know, they try to get rid of anything that, um, that, that isn't right or, or, you know, people with issues, um, that's not who we are. Um, and I think we've carried over and learned some of those things from, you know, that dominant culture, but we need to get back to who we are and being sympathetic and resolving some of the issues and, like all of us are one step away from, you know, being thrown out of our houses or getting sick or going through something um, bad. But so we need to be more sympathetic to, um, to people and what they're going through and help them out because we know what, you know, having these stigmas, we know what prejudice feels like, we know what discrimination, all of us know what discrimination feels like. And to do it to ourselves, it doesn't help this situation. It doesn't help resolve what we can fix, um, changes that we can actually make. And so we need to get you know, back to that. And that's what our institutions were put in place for, the Black church, the HBCUs, uh, the Black businesses. That's what they're there for, to help move us and propel us forward and to teach us is another way to go about doing things um, than what dominant society or culture, the way that they do things. Um, and we need to get back to that. It's difficult, um, but it's something that we need to do um, if we're gonna make a change. Thank you. Uh, Trey, from a uh, policy health access point of view, what's the greatest need seen in your work? Wow. Okay. Okay. Let's get to the nitty gritty, y'all. Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh, sheesh. All right. If I had to pick, right, what is the greatest need? Seeing your work from a policy health access point. Oh, my gosh. Okay. I, um, I'm going to go with two things, right? I'm going to tie them together uh, really, um, really wisely. So I don't know, and I'm sure some people may be familiar with this, right? So Health insurance, right? Health insurance uh, can put these, um, I don't, I'm trying to think what they want to call it. I will say um, clicks, right? They can put these clicks onto your account. So what that means is, uh, and they started uh, attempting to do this, uh, uh, maybe I'm going to say about, I can't, maybe about 10 years ago or so. But it was those who are testing, uh, testing for HIV, right? So they don't have to be HIV positive. They're testing for HIV. They can put a click on your account that can then, you know, be part of determining your rate, whether your rate should increase or whether your rate should decrease, more importantly, because you test it for HIV, right? And the reason for that is because they said, well, by you testing for HIV, you could potentially, that could potentially mean you are partaking in risky activities, right? So due to that, that can increase, right? And that has been 
not not far different from health insurance, right? Um, I mean, well, not health insurance, but um, like like life insurance. It, it 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 trickled to well, maybe they can you know partake in that same matter some way. So I think one of the biggest aspects of it is is that realizing um, that you know the health access, uh, what they do is you know, they, they kind of, they kind of create a profile for you, right? And this profile says like, you know, what is your risk factors, right? Your risk factors for you potentially uh, catching a life threatening um, infection, right? So what is your risk factor for this? What is the risk factor? What city you live in? You know, what's, you know, what's the risk factors around you? And they help that, you know, create your, your policy and at some point create your policy rate amount. And that is super, super, super huge, right? Because I have, you know, I have had some clients I worked with. They're like, I don't know why my policy went up and I can't even afford the policy I got. You know, what's going on? So then I have to get on the phone and, you know, we do some calling and some back and forth with the insurance companies, attempt to advocate and try to attempt to find out what the real issue is. And, you know, come to find out that has been the issue. Um, and that is a big burden for um, the community, right? Um and then I think another one I would um, I would like to say when it comes to um, access a little bit is it always stems back to the uh, de-sting- uh, destigmatization of HIV and AIDS. So when you think about that, so one of the things I was just talking with a colleague of mine, and we were talking about you know those who you know like those who can um, if you uh, transmit H- um, HIV to someone else that you could be uh, arrested and charged with attempt murder, right? Um, if you really look at that, I don't know if we're really seeing what we're telling people, right? We're telling you, although we're saying that my diagnosis is not me, although we're saying that my, you know, my diagnosis doesn't define me, but we're telling you because of your diagnosis, and if you provide that with, if you if you transmit to someone else, that you can be charged with 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 attempt murder. So you're telling the community that that is, that that diagnosis will murder you, that that, that, that diagnosis will kill you. And that's a big uh, 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 stigma toy, right? And when we think of those stigmas, with us, with those, those stigmas just don't, they're just not these floating stigmas in the air. Those stigmas prevent people from getting tested, right? So why do I want to go get tested? You know, because it's not just a backlash of me having to find out my results or we have to tell my family and, and my community, it's, I've been looked at from the government a certain type of way, I'm looking to be looked at from the community a certain type of way. So it creates these stigmas that affects the communities that we serve tremendously, right? And like I said, I could go on and on and on about these policies and health access points, but to, I guess to sum it all up, to see what is the greatest need in my work, the greatest need in my work is really, um, is really finding um, uh, really finding a, a equals a equal mean the same way like I said attacking the way we did COVID the same way how you can go get COVID tests for free the way you can go get COVID vaccinations for free the way you don't have to have X you don't have to have an idea you don't have to have insurance and things like that you know because that's the only that's the real thing that I believe will be directly um, useful. And, and in the HIV and, and, and aid uh, epidemic is by making realize this is this is something global. This is something that's affecting many individuals, right? And hitting it face forward. And I think do that, we will break the stigmas and we'll see more people tested for HIV and AIDS. We'll see, uh, I mean, what I mean, we'll see a high range of more people. And then I guess just the, the last part is in nonprofit work and community work, right? We are bound by deliverables, right? So a lot of here, a lot of us here come from nonprofit backgrounds. We we live off of grants and donations, so we're bound by deliver uh, deliverables, right? So one of the things that I have been trying to fight away from is taking those deliverables. So deliverable, we have to test this amount of people. We have to do, do this by saying, I, like, by not forcing community members to be tested for HIV, you know, at events. So what a lot of organizations do is they say, okay, in order to get in this event for free, you have to be tested by HIV and provide us with your results. And this will help you get free um, access into, you know, this event. And more importantly, what I have been doing lately is taking that away, 
having HIV testing and other STI testing there as optional basis because I'm not forcing an individual to find out when they're around a thousand other individuals, you know, that they can't truly process or that they go in a denial or a shutdown mode, right? I am uh, providing opportunities for people to find out their statuses when it is right for them. And I think that is the most important part. It is not just about, you know, what's your status, what's your status, you know, find out your status when it's right for you at the right moment to assure that we can provide you with the best support possible. And, and that's and that's some knowledge for your ass. Trey gave some knowledge for your ass. That's facts, how you, facts. And that's how you clear a question. <laughs> <laughs> um, lastly, the last question of the panel before we, you know, get into the break and, you know, get into our Q&A uh, with, the, with the audience. So thank you guys for, uh, the audience, thank you guys for, for being here. Uh, Nikki, this, this one is for you. Uh, what do you feel like is the greatest knowledge gap or where does it come from when it comes to supporting those living with HIV AIDS that could remove stigma? Yeah, so I have a few things. This was a really good question. So one thing, the biggest knowledge gap is just knowing the truth about HIV. So I remember when I got diagnosed, um, when I received the diagnosis, I was everything I ever thought HIV was. So whatever myths I had, I believe those myths, whatever lies I had, I had those too. So there has to be a relearning that happens um, if you receive an HIV diagnosis. So to decrease the stigma. So what will happen is if you believe the myth of uh, what's one that you could get it, I don't know, from toilet seats or you can get you can transmit it from hugging somebody or touching somebody. You may find yourself like, oh, I can't, I can't hug my child anymore. I can't do this anymore. And that's not true, right? And it's just, this is just a very example of what I mean by the knowledge gaps. We have to make sure, I have to make sure that I lead them to the resources to be educated or that I provide um, some education for them because that's a big problem because we just don't forget what we've been taught for all these years. That's not true. And then also another thing, um, Another knowledge gap is just where the resources are. So if you go and say you get tested at your private medical doctor, if they're not aware of what community resources are available, you may find yourself only getting what they have available. And you may not realize there are more resources for you because there is a time that you have to adjust because it can be mentally taxing to receive something, news like that. And unfortunately, I know a number of women, I don't know if the statistic, they find out while pregnant that they have the HIV diagnosis. So you get tested during prenatal care and you also get tested at delivery. So they're finding at different times and that can be overwhelming and taxing. So we need to make sure um, that we, they have a space where they can learn and also see other women who may have had that story that while that wasn't my story I know other women who have that story and it could be a source of hope because you really feel like it's just you and when you feel like it's just you it it perpetuates stigma it causes you to isolate pull back and really fall into some dark places but when we can share hope and we can share that there are, you're not alone and there are safe spaces for you it could really decrease that stigma, especially self-stigma, which I don't think I brought up, but I love to talk about it because I always said that you can't stig stigmatize me more than I've already done it to myself. And self-stigma is a real thing among people living with HIV because we have these thoughts already. So everything you're saying to us, we've probably already thought about it and turned it inwardly. And we have to work really hard to break that. And that's why you'll begin to see so many women and men begin to share their stories because they've broken that self stigma. And when you see that freedom, now everybody's not called to share their story. I don't believe that. But those that are, when we break it, we also break free because there are other people we feel that needs to be broken free um, from that too. So those are my thoughts. I'm over there talking. I'm on mute. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, so we're gonna we're gonna take one last break. Um, and I'm gonna throw it to uh Dr. Pearl um for this last break, and then she'll come, she'll bring us back for the QA. 
Okay, I just want to thank everyone, uh, for all the panelists for the inspiration and the wealth of knowledge. We will now open it up to Q&A. Um, so if you could just chat, put in your questions. We have a few questions already in the Q&A, and I believe that we're going to watch the video next. Correct, Mr. Nolan? And then we'll come back with Q&A questions. Actually, for the essence of time, I just want to give one plug around testing for tomorrow. We'll go to the Q&A and then we'll just end with um, one last video. Um, but again, thank you to all of our panelists for guiding us through this discussion. Um, one of the critical points that both uh, Nikki J mentioned as well as Dr. Drury um, is around like knowledge and information. Uh, Trey also hit on this. Um, and so we want to, again, remind people we're doing a HIV testing drive at Mondawmin Mall tomorrow at Total Healthcare's Mondawmin Mall Health Center. Um, again, uh, Total Healthcare is a FQAC, a federally qualified health center, meaning we offer primary care, um, pediatrics, dental, mental health support. And so when, um, as well as HIV um, and infectious disease services. And so it's not just um, treating this one ailment or this one symptom, but it's how you treat the whole person. Um, and that, what, that is what makes um, Total Healthcare very unique as a healthcare provider. Um, and so we want to be able to give knowledge and information for people so that they are aware of um, their status and then how they can take care of themselves as well as those around them. Um, so again, just wanna plug that, we'll be there um, from nine to 4 p.m. We also be having raffles and giveaways um, for some really cool items. So uh, we definitely want everyone to come out and support and find out your status. Um, so I'll turn it over again to our Q&A session um, before we close out. Yes, thank you. I wanna thank everyone. Once again, all the panelists. Thank you, Mouse, for being a wonderful moderator. Thank you, Nikki. Thank you, Trey. Thank you, Dr. Drury, just for sharing your experiences and your wealth of knowledge as it relates to the topic. We have several questions in the Q&A chat. Uh, question number one is, how can we socially dismantle the idea that going to get tested in person for HIV is going to is, is a visit that is taboo, but as listed in the chat is going to visit the, uh, the boogeyman. So Nikki, if you can address that for me, please. So the question is, how can we change how we view getting tested? For yeah, HIV? it's taboo. Uh -huh. It's being yeah. taboo to go get it in person. Mm -hmm. Um, it's a taboo. So I think that uh, knowledge is very powerful. So things are taboo because we make them taboo, right? So I remember being in school and uh, it, you, you couldn't talk about sex. It was very taboo. You say anything about sex was very taboo. It's not so much now because it takes other people saying there's nothing wrong with talking about sex, right? It's nothing wrong with the word, using the right language. And I think the same could go for getting an HIV test. And I think it starts with us saying that there's nothing wrong with getting an HIV test. I have one and it encouraged those around you to have, to have HIV tests as well. And sometimes it takes those moments like this where you come and you have these great, amazing panel of people talking about it. I'm, um, I'm a woman living with HIV. You have a doctor here, you have an advocate here. You got a MC here, Mouse Jones is doing an amazing job. And we're all giving the same message and it'll break the stigma off of you. Like, you know what? Maybe it's not a bad thing to go get an HIV test. And once you do it, it will um, it will encourage you to, to get it done every three to six months. And then when you tell another friend, like, I got an HIV test. And one thing that I've done for people, um, which I don't do this now, but I've had people close to me ask me to go with them. And that really helped them. So sometimes having someone you can trust will help take some of that stigma and taboo off of getting um, an HIV test. And then learning the truth about HIV helps too, because the stigma is really um, as a result of thinking, I remember you get HIV test, you think if I'm positive, I'm gonna die. And that's not happening. People are living 30, 40 years. They're, well, it's only around 40 years, but like they're living 20, 30 years. Let me say that correctly. They're living long, healthy lives. They're thriving, having children um, that are HIV negative, spouses living their best life. So when you change what you view about HIV, it will actually get rid of the taboo. 
Okay, thank you, thank you. So this question is for uh, Trey. I'm gonna date my age. When I was in college, salt and Pepper had a song, let's talk about sex. So there's a question in the Q&A. It says, when is it too early to talk about HIV AIDS? Trey, could you just briefly uh, respond to that question? When is it too early to talk about HIV AIDS? Awesome, thank you. Um, hmm. <laughs> um, Okay, I'm, I'm gonna give you um, my point of view. Then I'm gonna give you a, a educational point of view. Um, I don't think um, my, I don't think it's never too early to talk about sex. Um, I don't think it's never too early to talk about HIV and AIDS. I think um, more importantly, I think we should start talking about HIV and AIDS. Um, you know, I, my opinion, I say in middle school. And the reason why I say that is because if you all look at the time frame in, you know, to joy to sex, and I'm sorry for that. If you look at the time frame, people are, you know, youth are starting to engage within sexual activities around the fifth grade, right? Fifth, sixth grade. So I think due to that, it is really important to talk about it, you know, at that young age. I think it's, it is tremendously. And I think what makes it even more important is because television, right? So we all know we got um, anybody who got kids or nieces or nephews or any uh, any siblings, you know, now they're on iPads and on YouTube at at, uh, at four years old. They know how to navigate it. They know how to interact with it. So if they can be on iPads, on YouTubes, and they can be, you know, watching television at that age, I think it is important to then expose them at a younger age to talk about it because it helps you know, de derail that stigma before it comes, right? So if they learn about it on the internet, or they learn about it in a movie that this person who had this this disease called, you know, this, then, you know, then they're going to build that stigma, right? So as kids, you know, we take in our whole surroundings. So I think if we talk about it with them from a younger age, we can prevent them before they even build that stigma toy to say, yeah, you know, so, you know, this happens and this is how this happened and this is could be why it's happening, but this will happen when this does happen. And I think it would be very educational. And I think also it would be a really big part of the movement of ending the AIDS and HIV epidemic. Thank you, Trey. Thank you. Dr. Drury, in the Q&A chat, uh, maybe you could chime in. Are people becoming more relaxed with HIV because now individuals um, can become undetectable? It's more and more talk about undetectable, as you talked about the commercial that encourages people to get colon, get their colon uh, screened. Um, I'm not sure that it's become you know, more relaxed, but I mean, I do know that, you know, when, when we first started talking about HIV AIDS, you know, 40 years ago, like people were like just scared to death and like, you know, the, the devastating consequences of contracting, you know, this disease was death. Um, and so I think that has changed now because it's moved from, an inevitable death sentence to, at this point, is really a, a chronic illness um, that that people, as as Nikki indicated and said, like people can live and live their best life um, with um, with HIV. Um, I think a lot of people need to know um, that there are medications out there. Um, and I don't, I don't know if a whole lot of people actually know that, that there are medications that can be taken to help prevent getting HIV. Um, you know, and, um, and they're highly effective. But I, I think I've, I've seen some information saying like the, you know, PrEP or PREP um, has reduced the risk of getting HIV, you know, from sex by 99%. And I don't think people really know that um, people who take it or, or who um, inject, you know, drugs, um, it has been effective in at least 74 percent of the cases. So there are I don't I don't think it's necessarily relaxed, but I think the uh, it's changed. A lot of people may not know that but for some reason we don't talk about it as much because it's probably about a, a little over a million people in the United States that are infected with the disease, but there's still numbers to say that this is an epidemic that we need to do something about. Um, I think the most important thing, or one of the things is that it's still 13 to 16% of the population 
that walk around not knowing their status. Um, and, you know, we talked about stigma, we talked about, you know, those things, um, but we need to do something about that because people would rather not know. But I think if they know now, they should be aware that there are, you know, resources out there that you can, you can do everything that you have been doing um, and live your life um, with this disease. Thank you, Dr. Jervy. Nikki, for, this, for the sake of time, I'm going to wrap three questions into one. So for those who may not know, could you just share briefly what are the symptoms of HIV and does everyone have the same symptom? And when you're sharing that, could you also share some insight? How can a person tell a loved one that they're HIV positive or if they're living with a loved one that is HIV, that's very negative, have a negative opinion about HIV, will be a great strategy for someone to share that with a family member. So just briefly about the symptoms, are they the same? And do we, um, what advice do you have to share for a family member? Okay, so symptoms, um, this is a really good question. Um, the sub, everybody doesn't have the same symptoms and some people have no symptoms, right? They say most, they say 95%, maybe you have a fever and it's like flu-like symptoms. So they're so non-specific. You'll never know, you may, you may never know it's HIV or related to HIV unless you get a test. That's why testing is so important. And when we look at um, HIV without any treatment or anything, you can go about 10 years with no symptoms that's, that, that you don't know it. So that's why I just wanna em emphasize testing. <laughs> because that's why. So no, all symptoms aren't the same. For me, um, I only was able to relate it after I got tested. So that's that was my story. And I talked about that. And then when it comes to sharing your diagnosis disclosure, I love talking about disclosure. Um, the first things first, is what I want to say about disclosure. You have to prepare yourself first. You have to make sure that you're ready, especially for like a loved one. I'm talking about like a mother or a father or a friend. I'm not talking about in dating and relationship because Trey talked about this. There are laws um, in every state and um, I'm, that's not my area. But when you want to tell a trusted friend or a loved one, you got to make sure you're prepared because people are unpredictable. And you want to make sure that you are emotionally uh, well enough to handle what they may say, right? You And make sure that you are also even open enough to give them time. So I've shared with people that were close to me before I went public with anything. And at that point, it didn't matter. But I've shared people close to me in previous times and they had I thought they didn't understand and I was a little hurt. But come to find out they needed a moment to deal with their selves first and go get them some emotional support to be able to support me. So you have to be mature enough to realize that they may not respond how you want them to respond, but hope for the best. And for me in my personal life, I have been fortunate enough to where most responses have been positive toward me. And when I did share my status publicly, I realized that I spent years missing out on a support system through my family. And they absolutely still love me. So I want you to hold on to that too. While it's scary, uh, if someone wants to disclose a very close family member, um, get, you, get you a group of people that can hold you together if possible, but always remember that they love you, even if they at first they didn't understand. Thank you. Mr. Nolan? Uh, that was a, a, a perfect ending, uh, Nikki. Um, and it's really about creating uh, communities of love for each other, of support. Um, sometimes that's from blood, and then sometimes it's not. Um, it's our friends, uh, it's our chosen family, uh, it's our family um, that is able to offer and be that support for us. Um, and so uh, whether you, you know who that is, or it's someone that you find in total healthcare, as a part of PCOM, as someone who you meet on social media like Nikki J, as a school support system that you meet um, at Coppin, um, as, as professors, as, as guidance counselors, um, that is 
and the essence of the work that we do. It's all about building each other up and supporting each other. Um, so again, I want to thank you all for uh, this engaging conversation tonight. Um, I learned some things. Uh, I changed, you know, just different ways around um, clarity around how I can support um, individuals. And again, how the responsibility to stop the virus um, is all of ours. And so how we can come together for that. Um, again, I want to thank our partners, Coppin State University, the nonprofit leadership program. Um, Tyler had to run the class, but a special thank you to Tyler um, as a student um, in supporting this event. Um, our partners at PECOM, Gilead Sciences, United Healthcare, um, a very huge thank you. And again, thank you to Mouse Jones. Um, and thank you to Dr. Pearl uh, for helping to sponsor this event. Thank you, Mr. Nolan. And once again, I would just like to thank everyone, everyone that Mr. Nolan mentioned. It's been an awesome opportunity to partner with Total Healthcare for this timely discussion. Our goal at Coppin State, the nonprofit leadership program, is to have real talk with real community partners, and Total Healthcare is one of them. Thank you again, Mouse. Thank you to my colleague, Dr. Drury, Nikki J, and Trey. It's been an awesome. Thank you also to Kelly. Uh, Jackson and Robert Harper for our technology and also Leslie, Leslie Jean. And once again, thank you to the College of Behavioral Social Sciences and the Department of Applied Social, Social Sciences. As we end tonight's session, I'd like to leave you with two quotes. One by Nikki J, our panelist. She said, uh, people will listen to you to listen to what you have to say because you have influence. So with the information that was shared today, Sweet Honey in a Rock, one of my favorite music groups, uh, the leader, Bernice Reagan, she says, it's important for us to teach what we learn. And another quote I would like to end for you to reflect on as we think about the nonprofit movement, Booker T. Washington once said, the happiest people are those that do the most for others. So this evening, we invite you to support Total Health Care in achieving their mission, but we also invite you to join the movement the nonprofit leadership movement. Good night. This concludes the program. Join the movement, the Coppin State Nonprofit Leadership Movement. Have a good evening.